Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Who doesn't have lesson five? Raise your hand. Okay. Who can I get to help pass out? Johnny, could you? Roger. I've got a few, still got a few copies here. David left. I think several got. I'll give you about half of those, maybe something like that. OCD here. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> if you care to hand some of those out for me on this side. Thank you, John. <clears throat> We've been studying a series from Dan Winkler on uh, forgiven, forgiving, and free. And David has done an excellent job with this. I uh, really appreciate him taking this class. Uh, we weren't here last week, <clears throat> and I hate that we missed the the lesson uh, that, that he had on this. <clears throat> we're on lesson five. And we're talking about uh, forgiving ourselves. And there's another section of this coming next week too uh, also. So be prepared for that. And I think most of y'all have lesson six. Who, who does not have lesson six? Okay, what I'm going to do there is if you want lesson six, I've got copies right up here. Or David left copies. I won't take credit for that. There are several copies right here. If you would, just grab one this morning, and uh, we'll be ready for next week. <clears throat> I want to have a word of prayer before we start, and uh, then we'll get started with our class. Let's bow together. Our dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you for this day you've given us to come together Father, to be able to study from your word and to glean from it. Father, help us to love your word, to study it. Father, to live by it. Father, help us to have a forgiving heart so we can forgive others, Father, and forgive ourselves. And Father, so that you can forgive us. Be with us as we study. Father, help our minds to be focused on your word and to to take it in and use it in our lives today. Father, be with those who are struggling right now and that are sick, that we know about, and we pray a blessing for them, Father, today, if it be your will. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> our memory verse for this week, Romans 8, 37. Everybody turn there. Romans 8, 37. <clears throat> you don't have to pardon me. I'm <clears throat> to clear up here. Romans 8.37. Someone read that for me. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Okay, how are we more than conquerors? Okay, we're conquerors, we know that. How are we more than conquerors? Okay. Well, how are we conquerors? Let's just start there. Good answer. Christ has overcome. Exactly. You know, God's love and mercy we've, has already conquered. And we're now, it's kind of funny how Mr. Dan said this. It, it's interesting. We're now enjoying the spoils of the victory, so to speak. Because the victory's already been won. We, we've already won the victory through Jesus. So that, that's how we can become more than conquerors, uh, through Christ. And also brings a peace living with our past. From you know we're, we, are, we all have a past, and we are having to live with that. And how do we live with it? And we're going to study some more on that this morning. <clears throat> On your handouts, lesson five, we're going to start with um, the starter questions to get, get, some, get our minds rolling this morning. Uh, are you perfect? I see some no's. I want you to think about it. Are you perfect? Really? <laughs> Johnny says only in Christ. 
That's exactly right. We, we are made perfect. We understand that. I think most of us understand how we are made perfect through Jesus. In and of ourselves, we are not perfect. And we need to realize that it is only because of Jesus that we are made perfect. And through his blood. You know, 1 John 1, 7. I want us to turn there. We're going to be there a few times this morning. Um, 1 John 1, 7 through 10, really. We'll start at verse 7. <clears throat> Someone read 1 John 1, verse 7, please. Go ahead and read through verse 10 too, Mary, please. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our life. Okay. How can we react? You and I react to sin in our lives. We got three ways we want to talk about this morning that we how we can react to sin that we know that we have in our life. And these verses right here tell us how we can re how we will react because there's really only three ways you can. The first one, if you're writing in on your handouts, I have no sin. I have no sin. In verse 8, when you have no sin and you think you have no sin, where does that put you? What kind of mindset does that put you in? Doesn't it kind of lend to saying, hey, I'm okay with God. Maybe me and God got this thing that we, me and him, you know, and, and I'm okay with the way I am and I don't, I don't really need him. Number two, I have, I have sinned. That's in verse 9. In other words, I have done what God says that I have done. Because he said, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Number three, I have not sinned. And it's kind of similar to the first one, a little bit different. But in other words, it's saying what I am doing is okay. Maybe you, you think you're okay, but you're really not. Kind of lends to that. <clears throat> and one of these three is the proper way. And I bet you'll never guess which one it is. <laughs> which one is the proper way? Absolutely. We, we accept the fact that we know we are sinners. Sir? Confession. Big one, big one. It lends to... Uh, what we're about to get into here, Johnny, in a little bit, carries confession, like Johnny said, carries the idea of saying the same thing someone else is already saying. So in other words, God has already told us that we've sinned and fallen short, so what does our reaction need to be to that? When God tells you you're a sinner and you for all have sinned, then what? Right, I want you to repent. Exactly. He wants us to be able to confess this sin that we have so that we can start on a journey to being in a right relationship with God. <clears throat> but there's a, there's a little bit of a... Uh, some people might think there's a little bit of a hiccup here. 1 John 3 and verse 9. I don't, I don't want to spend a terrible lot of time here but because we... Maybe a little short of time, but 1 John 3, 9. Someone read that verse for me, please. 1 John 3, 9. 1 John 3 and verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. It says we cannot sin. Wait a minute. It said we're sinners. Over here in 1 John, earlier in 1 John, so now he's saying we cannot sin. 
Somebody explain that to me. What is, what's the difference here? Can't, can't conflict. What's the difference here? One, one side we're a sinner, and the next side we cannot sin. So what's, what's going on? Johnny says if we confess, God forgives us as he sees us. And that's a great point. Great. Great explanation of the verse. Because we're, we are going to sin even after we become Christians. And the Bible talks about uh, in these same verses here, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And his blood does what? continually cleanses us exactly and I'm so thankful that it does aren't y'all because I, I've got a past too just like everyone else and I'm so glad that we have God's grace and and my problem is when I forget don't forgive myself is, is letting God's grace do what it was intended to do and that doesn't mean just go out and sin all you want to and just do what you want to it's having the heart of confession, understanding where you are as a sinner before God. And that is the only time we can become acceptable to God. And I, I love the grace of God because if it wasn't for that, none of us would be able to be here today. Uh, we've got a video clip again I want to play. Um, Marty, we're ready whenever you guys are. And I want you to think about these words up here on the board. Uh, David usually puts them on, so they'll be in the video here. Yes, sir. I want you to think about a football field. How far is it? 100 yards. Okay? Now string nine and a half of them together and raise them up vertically. You have 950 yards straight up. The world's largest rock is that tall. It's nine and a half football fields high. Nine and a half football fields high. It covers a landmass of almost 19 miles. It's in Western Australia, and it's called Mount Augustus, even though it's a rock. How long do you think it would take you to use a jackhammer and turn that massive rock into a pile of small rocks? What about this rock? Just this one. Do you think I could use a little ball peen hammer and turn this one large rock into a mound of pebbles? If I beat on it until my shoulders hurt, my forearm knots, and my hand cramps around the handle of the hammer, how long would it take me to bust up this one boulder? That's ridiculous, I know. But that's what many of us try to do with our past. We feel awful about ourselves because we look behind us and we see a, a bunch of boulders. The stuff we've done, not done, not done well. So we try to bust up these boulders and grind them into a powder that's so fine we don't have to deal with the guilt. Think with me about some evasive ways we respond to our guilt and then a more effective way to live with our guilt. Let's begin with some of the evasive ways we respond to our guilt. The ball peen hammers, if you please, we take to the boulders of our past. One of the first things we're tempted to do is to engage in deflection. We try to change the direction of feelings and deflect our negative thoughts to another. We insert someone else into our past and blame them for what we did. That's what Adam did. God asked, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? 
paraphrased. Have you done what I told you not to do? Listen to Adam's answer. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. It's this woman's fault, he said. And by the way, it's your fault too, God, because you're the one who gave her to me. How well did that ball-peen hammer work in busting up the boulder of Adam's pasts? Here's another evasive move. Diversion. Some of us respond to guilt with anger. We get mad at ourselves for making bad decisions. We get frustrated over the consequences that come. We, we've even gotten upset to the point that we try to uh, turn away from those that help us. So we deal with guilt by diverting our feelings of anger to these folks or to someone else. Remember John the Baptizer? King Herod and Herodias were living in adultery. And John told them they didn't have the right to be together. Three of the four Gospels tell us that Herod did what he did to John for the sake of Herodias. We would say the government profiled John, handcuffed him, locked him up, and executed him without a trial. In fact, they mutilated him, cutting his head off his body because of the way a woman responded to her guilt. Now, when we see a speck in someone else's eye, but ignore the beam in our own eye, when we dislike another because we're disappointed in ourselves, when we're envious of another's success because we failed, when we're unkind to our family because we don't like the kind of person we've become, when we divert our feelings of guilt to and mistreat others, we're using the same ball-peen hammer that Herodias used. Here's another, another evasive move, mortification. Because of guilt, some of us are so self-loathing, we don't mistreat others, we mistreat ourselves. If we want to lift ourselves up, we have to beat ourselves down. We deny ourselves by refusing to do something we like. We force ourselves to do something we don't like. Some of us have even gone as far as self-flogging. You help yourself when you hurt yourself is the idea. That's nothing new. Paul wrote about it in his letter to the Colossians. He called it the self-made religion of asceticism and severity to the body. He then went on to say, it has no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Don't miss those words, it has no value. It won't help us avoid the stuff that caused us to feel guilty in the first place. It's a ball-peen hammer beating against a boulder. Here's one more evasive move. Repression and rejection, they go together. Some of us refuse to accept our guilt and won't let anybody tell us that we're wrong or what we're doing is wrong. I'm okay. What I did or what I'm doing, it's okay. As we get toward the end of the Bible, we're warned about that kind of thinking. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's 1 John 1, verses 8 and 10. Look at that closer. When we repress our feelings of guilt and reject the idea of being guilty, we don't mistreat others. We don't mistreat ourselves. We actually mistreat God. We lie to ourselves, and then we accuse God of being the liar that we are. That's awful. That's a ball-peen hammer that will break in your hand when you try to use it. There's a better, a much more effective way to live with the boulders in our past. I know I can't move or beat this boulder into pebbles, so what if I were to ask you to help me to move it out of the way? Could we, this boulder here? 
You say we could if we had a crane. There you go. Now you're getting the idea. We have to use something bigger to move this rock. And that's the way it is with the stuff in our past. We have to turn to something bigger to move it out of the way. And that something bigger is God's grace. Just listen to Paul in writing to the Corinthians. He said, I'm the least, literally the littlest, the smallest of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He said something similar to what the prodigal son said. The prodigal said, I'm not worthy. Why did, why did Paul feel that way, not worthy? He was guilt ridden over his past. He told Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost, literally the first, 1 Timothy 1.15. He felt like he was in the back of the line of the apostles and at the front of the line of the sinners. I'm the best sinner of all times, he would say, and the worst apostle you can imagine. And again, he felt that way because of the stuff in his past. So how did Paul handle those feelings? Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Go back to 1 Timothy 1, where he said, I received mercy, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me. You'll never remove the boulders in your past. But God can. He's bigger than we are. In fact, when he forgives us, he throws those boulders, all that stuff away, and sees us as if they had never been there in the first place. You can jump through all sorts of hoops to get rid of guilt and shame, but it remains. To get rid of it, you have to start thinking about God's grace more than your guilt. That's the secret. If we want to live with our past, we need to see ourselves through the eyes and feelings of God when we're forgiven. Look at that memory verse that we've been working on. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, Romans 8, 36. We're what? More than conquerors. How? It's because of him who loved us. Grace, like Paul, to live with our guilt, we need to be willing to say, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let's think of that some more with our study leader. And I look forward to getting back with you and studying one more time. How many of us fit in some of those categories? I do. <laughs> I fit some of these, some of them more than others. How do you deal with your guilt that we have in, in keeping us from forgiving ourselves? How do you handle it? How do you look at the grace of God in order to handle it? Uh, do, we, do we blame, try to change the direction? Did y'all hear the words in there where he was talking about? We try to blame someone else like Adam did. What about the anger part? How many of us get angry, get mad at ourselves? I, this, is, this is one one of mine right here, so I, I can take it out on somebody else. That's a sign of our guilt. What about hurt? hurting yourself, mistreating yourself because you just you're just bad. Denial. Pride is what causes this one. We don't accept that we're wrong. We can't come to grips with that I've actually done something wrong and, and so what a dangerous spot to be in. When we're talking about the grace of God and we can't admit that we've done something wrong, that, that's tough. 
that's a tough place to be. And any comments on the video on what we've had so far? All right, we're going to move on to the study harder questions and try to try to get finished up before the bell rings on us. <clears throat> we are saved by God's grace through Jesus' blood. When we have what kind of faith? And this is in your book, pages 38 to 41. Like Abraham's, exactly. If you're filling in your, your paper, that's Abra like the faith of Abraham. <clears throat> You know, Abraham, what, what was the story there? What, what happened? He did? Right. What he did? What, that's, a, that's a great example. What, what did God promise them, him and Sarah? Another child. What, did, what was their reaction to that? Yeah, how old was she? Mm-hmm. What was Abraham's reaction? The same, wasn't it? How old was he? 100. 100 years old. But what? There was a level of unbelief there, and I don't want to cross over here and think, okay, God uses, God, God will, and this has happened to a lot of us, he will take our faith that we have, and it maybe it ain't enough for the next step yet, but he blesses us even in our doubt. Does that happen to y'all? Have y'all ever doubted? And then, and then something happened? I mean, you have in the back of your mind, you know, I know God can fix this, I know he can heal me, but I don't know if he will or not. I ain't real sure about it. You know, he may be trying to teach me a lesson here, and I don't, maybe I just need to just take it and go. What do you think? God work like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. But what did they do in, anyways? Abraham did what? With, with your first one, when he was told to leave. He, he obeyed. He, he did what God told him to, even though you may not just be like, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm going to go and do it anyways. That's exactly right. That's what you do with God. You trust him that much, and you obey him and let him work it out, the rest of it. And you know you've done what God asked you to do, and I know that too. Don't stop believing that God can do some things, or anything for that matter, because he can. And he has. And y'all can look back just like I can in your past, and you can see where God has made a big, big impact in your life, in my life. And he answered a prayer that we doubted. I've, I've been there, and a lot of you have too. He answered a prayer the way we wanted it answered. This is what I mean by that. Okay, turn to Romans 8 and verse 1. Romans 8 and verse 1. <clears throat> We're going to answer these three questions. Number two on the study harder questions. Someone read that for me. Romans 8 and 1. Okay. When or what time frame is this talking about? When can we know something? Now. Right now. Right now. We can know. The second one. The first one is when. Second one is what. What promise is this verse talking about?
Right. It's a promise that we know we're, not go we're going to heaven. We're not going to hell. We can know that. We can understand that. That there is no condemnation. There's no condemnation. And right now we can know that we are not going to hell. It's not a doubt. Have you ever doubted that? Wondered? Yeah, I don't know. If somebody asks you if you're saved, you know, well, I, I think I am. I hope I, hope I am. And my dad asked me that one time, and he said, well, Jerry, and I stumbled all over it like a goofball. And then he, he looked at me and he said, well, let me ask you like this. He said, are you lost? Are you going to hell? And that was a little quicker. I could answer that one a little bit quicker than I could because you didn't want to sound arrogant. You didn't want to sound like, oh, yes, uh, Dad, I'm going to heaven. Didn't you know? I mean, you know, we don't want to act like that, but we, we do want to say, hey, we're not, we're not lost. But our guilt can make us feel like we're lost if we don't have the proper view of God's grace and what that means. The last one there. Who is the verse talking about? Christians, exactly. Talking about those who are in Christ and the spiritual body there, and those who are following the Holy Spirit's teaching, the, the doctrine that we have, and, and are being obedient to that. Can we know, number three, can we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are not going to be lost or going to hell? Absolutely. How can we know that? That's the emphasis of Romans 8. In verse 1 that we just read. And also if you want to read some more on that, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11 is also a good read. And 1 John 5 and verse 13. 1 John 5, 13. We may know that we have eternal life. We can know this, y'all. We can. Because we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8 and verse 37. Thank y'all for your attention and Worship God here in this show.